Okay. All right, everybody, so let's get started. Um, welcome to the final seminar of the quarter for entomology. Um, we're ending with a bang today with Dr. Jeffrey Fader. Um, he got his PhD at Michigan State University working with Guy Bush. Um, he then had postdocs at Princeton and the University of Chicago. Uh, following that, he got a faculty position at the University of Notre Dame, where he is currently a professor in biological sciences. Uh, his lab there works on speciation and host specialization in the Ragolitis pominella um, species sibling complex. And um, they use field work and selection experiments and molecular genetics uh, to answer all sorts of interesting questions in this area. Um, they also are looking at uh, color polymorphisms in a bioluminescent Jamaican click beetle. Um, he's also the director of the GLOBES program there, the Global Linkages of Biology, Environment, and Society. Um, so without further ado, I'll get started. Oh, thanks. Can everybody hear me in the back? It's fine. Good. Um, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Meredith, for inviting me. It's been a lot of fun so far. Thanks you all for being here today. And I'm going to tell a story about um, uh, genomic architecture of speciation today. And of course, speciation is the ultimate source of, of biodiversity. And so this is sort of the big issue, at least in putting the talk today in the context. We're trying to understand speciation and biodiversity. But specifically, I want to sort of concentrate on the question of what's the nature and role that genome structure itself might play in speciation? And I'm particularly interested in this question with respect to taxa or populations that are diverging in the face of gene flow or migration between the populations. That is, let's say, in a geographic context of what we call parapatry, um, partially geographic overlap of population, or sympatry, that is, would be more complete geographic um, overlap of, of populations. Now, We've learned quite a bit about the genetics of, of speciation over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, and it, it particularly was sort of an emphasis on identifying individual genes that are contributing to reproductive isolation. We could call this sort of the hunt for uh, speciation um, genes. And this has been quite informative about telling us about the genetic basis of, of reproductive isolation that can be contributing to speciation. Uh, there's a couple of, of of difficulties here, though, uh, many of these genes that have been identified so far affect uh, postzygotic incompatibilities, and a lot of times these um, crosses are done uh, to investigate the genetics of, of speciation through sort of long established and somewhat highly diverged taxa, and so some of these loci may have uh, actually uh, diverged after speciation was essentially complete, and also. Um, more importantly for the talk today, um, the hunt for the speciation genes, it's, it's been quite um, informative, but it, it also misses another issue, and that is um, thinking about how the genes themselves that are diverging are arrayed together in, in genomes, and might diverge collectively and might um, influence um, further differentiation during the formative stages of speciation. And so today, we're going to concentrate on this fly here as our main character, Ragolides pominella. Um, Ragolides pominella, of course, is a model system for uh, ecological speciation with gene flow in phytophagous or host specific phytophagous plant eating um, insects. The basic premise for Ragolides pominella is that um, in the process of shifting and adapting ecologically to new host plants, this provides an impetus or some of the main factors that are driving the divergence process. And the particular example of Ragolides pominella shifting from its ancestral host, Hawthorne, or thorn apples, to introduce domesticated apples about 150 years ago in, a, in the eastern United States is often cited as an example of this type of, of sympatric or ecological um, speciation with gene flow in action in our own backyards. So this provides us with at least a, a known geography, sympatric, geographically overlapping, and a historical time frame within about the last 150 years ago the shift occurred. 
um, that allows us to sort of um, investigate or sets up the preconditions at least for doing an investigation of genomic patterns of differentiation underlying speciation with gene flow in the very early incipient stages. And the take home message I want to impart on you today um, and what we're going to do is we're going to integrate geographic surveys of genetic differentiation um, across sites with selection experiments and mapping experiments. And the take home message is that surprisingly or somewhat unexpectedly, um, at least in my opinion, um, what we seem to find are large continents of differentiation across the genome rather than small sort of isolated islands or genomic islands of speciation. A, a different genomic architecture at least underlying the incipient stages of host grace formation in this fly than I would have thought. <coughs> and what we're going to, um, one of the sort of implications of this is that maybe these, and I'll explain this a little bit more fully as we go, um, some of the low baseline levels of differentiation that we detect in genome scans, and by that a genome scan, what I mean is looking at populations and scanning a number of loci across the genome of the fly or, or organisms to, to um, characterize genetic differentiation on a sort of more genome-wide scale. Um, many of these studies sort of set a, a baseline level above what we'd expect statistically for um, neutrality. Um, in many cases, uh, actually, selection may be more genome-wide and widespread, right? And that that low level of, of neutrality that we set for statistical um, uh, purposes may actually be too high, and we're missing a number of, of regions of the genome might, might not be under as strong a selection, but are still under divergent selection during these early stages of, of population divergence. And that's the take-home message that I want to impart, and that's what's shown in this figure here. Rather than this view of sort of the of genomic architecture of divergence in, in these host traces of Raglitis flies, we see something that looks more akin to sort of a large uplifting and, and more widespread differentiation. Okay, so let's sort of take a step back and, and sort of lay the, uh, what, I, what I'm talking about today in a large context. And that, I'm saying, well, what often initiates speciation? And many times it could be that reproductive isolation due to divergent selection, um, adapting um, populations to different habitats, is an initial impetus or driver of the differentiation process. And so what I'm saying here, then, is that you could think about it in, in the context, let's say, of, of fitness trade-offs. Maybe we have two habitats, and you can see the association here with, the, with apple versus hawthorn for Raglini's pomonella, the, um, the host that attacked. Maybe we have two habitats here, on um, one environment, like a desert environment, the other environment maybe an alpine meadow environment, right? And, and what we've got is, is differential selection pressures on traits to adapt the population uh, to those different habitats, such that maybe a, a gene or an allele that's favored in producing a phenotype that uh, confers higher fitness, let's say, in our desert habitat, has the opposite effect and results in a phenotype of lower fitness in the alternative habitat, and vice versa. So this is our, our context for divergent ecological selection. And if this is the case, then we'd expect sort of to see a, a heterogeneous pattern of genetic differentiation throughout the genome. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that for genes that are directly under divergent selection between the two habitats, producing a phenotype that's directly selected for differentially, um, we'd expect to see if there's some gene flow going on between the populations. For these traits that are directly the targets of selection or, or nucleotide sites, we'd expect to see strong differentiation between our populations. So these regions of the genome, if we were to scan through, should show high levels of difference between our populations. We could also have genes that aren't directly under selection, or sites that aren't directly under selection, but are physically linked close by. And those, should, those sites should also show a degree of differentiation between our populations, but not as strong as those sites that are directly under selection. And then finally, we should see um, Sites that aren't directly under selection, again, neutral, at least in terms of fitness effects. 
but only that is at greater recombination distances to a locus directly under selection. And in this case, the, these genes should flow more freely between our populations that are divergently selected, and we don't expect then to see high levels of genetic difference between the populations if we were to score individuals at this locus in genotype level. So far, so good? Okay, so we expect the heterogeneous pattern of genomic differentiation, which uh, sort of has led to uh, a genomics islands of speciation sort of analogy. And that is, um, we might expect to see, initially during the speciation process of speciation with gene flow, um, <laughs> certain regions, just a few, scattered through the genome that are under high divergent selection that show differentiation between our populations. And then by a process that Cerevia is called divergence hitchhiking, we'd expect to see then reduced levels of gene flow in the immediate surrounding regions of the genome for those sites that are directly under selection. And this could allow then the accumulation of a different, uh, additional uh, new mutations that have smaller selection coefficients for them, actually, to hitch a ride and could facilitate then the fixation or the differentiation of these new mutations. And so we see a buildup of additional divergence around these initial sort of bridge heads or beach heads of divergence for strongly selected sites. And this has been argued to be um, a possible process that facilitates divergence with gene flow speciation. So here's sort of another view to, to, uh, to sort of um, think about this island analogy, this genomic islands of divergence analogy. Um, what we have here, what I show here is the extent of genetic divergence, right? And here we have like our seafloor, which would be really a truly purely neutrally evolving region of the genome. And then what I have here is our sea level. This would be sort of statistically what we position as um, the level above which we could statistically say we have differentiation between our populations above neutral expectations, therefore either the site is linked to or actually under selection. So here's our island popping above the sea level, here we have our selected locus, and here we have surrounding sites that are relatively, that could be tightly linked or linked to our site under selection that could also rise above neutrality, at least neutral expectations of the amount of divergence which between our populations. And um, what we could then do is a genome scan. Right? And what I have here is FST, degree of FST, which is a measure, a summary statistic of the degree of divergence between populations. And what one could do then is look at a number of loci uh, distributed across the genome and then set for um, all the low side, a level there, here's our C level then of neutral expectation, above which statistically we could say we have evidence potentially for divergent selection acting on this region or this locus or near this locus in the genome. So down here we have all of our, our sort of what we call non-outlier loci that are putatively neutral, and then the whole genome of our, our population pairs that we might be comparing, um, we could have certain outlier loci that statistically look to be more diverged than they should be based on neutral expectations. And we could say that those outlier loci are putatively under selection and might be candidate loci uh, for the targets of divergent selection or closely linked to them. And it's one of the classic studies that sort of um, established this sort of speciation um, island type of thinking or analogy was done by um, old native son Tom Turner uh, from Davis and looking at uh, mosquitoes, Anopheles scambia, and the M and S form. And they did a systematic scan by looking mostly at microarray hybridization uh, and characterizing levels of divergence between these two forms of mosquitoes. And the take home message was that they really only found just a few levels of the genome, or regions of the genome and markers that, exceed, that exceeded this sort of threshold sea level. And they um, 
christened the term genomic islands of divergence to characterize these few regions. Now, subsequently, there have been a number of, of genome scans that have been conducted in animals and, and plants, and there's been some generalities that sort of emerged from these studies that outlier type loci typically comprise a small portion of the genome, um, roughly 5 to 10 percent, um, with a mean of at least 8.5 percent in, in animals. Uh, there's been recent compilation of data from plants as well. It seems to be sort of a remarkably consistent pattern. I think it's 8.8 percent or something that have look, been discovered in um, a number of genome scans of, of plants. Uh, some of these studies have mapped some of these outlier loci. And in some cases, the loci appear to be clustered within specific and isolated genomic regions. Um, in other cases, they're not. So there's no really consistent pattern with respect um, to loci clustering. In some cases, QTLs have actually been associated with some of these genomic regions during differentiation for specific traits, and in other cases, not. Um, but there's an alternative to um, this idea of di divergence hitchhiking as well. And we could characterize it as an idea that Bill Rice um, first talked about in the 1980s. And in this case, we could characterize it as sort of widespread multifarious selection. There's another possibility. And here, uh, the, the situation may be that actually strong selection is working on a number of different regions of the genome initially during the divergence process. With with gene flow. That is, it may be that in often cases where we see differentiation take place in the face of genome, it may really require initially strong selection at a number of different places in the genome. And in this case, the um, effective level of migration between populations may be sufficiently reduced genome-wide, rather than just in specific regions, to allow the subsequent uh, accumulation of new mutations irregardless of linkage across the genome. Uh, essentially then, um, gene flow had, would become reduced sufficiently genome-wide that these populations are approaching what would be the situation if they were allopatric, geographically separated, and not exchanging genes at all. And so therefore, we could see sort of the rising boat across the whole genome, and not just in isolated regions. At least that's an argument. OK, so now we have a, a case study, Ragolini's Commonella. We, we, we can examine these alternatives. Here's a case of incipient um, sympatric differentiation associated with the host shift, and the premise being adaptation of the ancestral Hawthorne attacking population of these flies, shifting uh, Hawthorne population, so shifting over to apples, ecologically adapting and those ecological adaptations producing some reproductive isolation. And we could look at the pattern of differentiation genetically across the genome of these flies and see if it fits more with like this island view or if it fits more with a sort of widespread multivarious view of, of selection, divergent selection. And so what I'm going to tell you now is I'm going to couple some population surveys of these flies um, with some selection experiments on specific phenotypes that we know and environmental factors that we know are um, contributing to ecological adaptation in these flies, in particular on um, diapods of life history related traits, and along with mapping studies. So first let's look at some of the, these population genome scans, in which we've looked at, in this case, 33 microsatellites and six allozymes to get a, a picture of the view of genomic differentiation in these flies. And what I'm showing here is a map of our collecting sites. We've got four different sort of co-occurring populations that we surveyed that have apple um, infesting populations and Hawthorne infesting populations in close geographic proximity within like 100 meters or so. Um, arrayed in a latitudinal distribution across the Midwest. And I'm also going to look at one population of Hawthorne infesting flies from Texas. This just shows you the range of the Apple and Hawthorne um, races of Ragolides pominella. The red is the Apple race. It's mostly in the eastern and midwestern United States. And the Hawthorne infesting flock extends down into the southern United States. And here's uh, a map of, of the location of the markers that were 
uh, investigated. You can see that they're scattered throughout the genome. There's actually six chromosomes in this fly. There's a small dot, sixth chromosome, that we don't have any markers on. But generally speaking, the, uh, the markers are just um, arrayed across or throughout the genome of these flies. Um, there's no single linear map arrangement for um, some of these markers, as you'll see here, they form sort of complex patterns, and that's because there's inversion polymorphisms in several of the chromosomes of these flies. So that there's no single um, universal map order in all individuals. So here's the result of an out the outlier analysis looking at population differentiation across these four St. Patrick pairs in this population from Texas. And what we see from this, and here's our FSG values, and here's our statistical cutoff then um, for neutrality. And the take home message from this is that we actually see a pattern that's really consistent or seems to support the island hypothesis. There's actually only three loci in two genomic regions of the, of, um, in this fly that show significant outlier status. However, on closer examination of the data, um, particularly looking um, more specifically at the overall patterns we see across the genome or, or across geographic collecting sites, it's a much more complicated pattern and there's evidence for widespread um, differentiation across the genome in these flies. And, and this really highlights why it is uh, important to actually not just to confine yourself to a, a pair of populations, but really to get the whole geographic um, mosaic of, of uh, population differentiation when one's t trying to take into account how much of the genome is actually diverging um, with species in the gene flow. And what I show here is just eight of the, of the loci. Um, this is a general pattern that all 39 of the loci that we looked at showed. Just basically every single locus, at least in, in Hawthorne populations, Hawthorne back from FSA populations, you can see allele frequency here, here's our latitude of sites. The black here is are our Hawthorne sites. And what you see is that basically every single locus showed latitude declines within the Hawthorne race. Um, in comparison, the apple race, most of the loci also show latitudinal climbs in the apple infesting race. Sometimes that climb was in a similar direction as Hawthorne, of the Hawthorne race, as shown here and here. Sometimes the slope of the climb in the, in the apple infesting population was shallower than that in the Hawthorne infesting populations, and sometimes it was steeper. And in other cases, we actually see uh, a reversal of the climbs themselves in the apple. The, the, the sign of the decline or directionality of the climb was opposite. And so, basically, we found evidence for um, significant differences between apple and hawthorn in the allele frequencies as the microsatellites and the allosomes at 32 of the 39 markers we said, we surveyed, the majority. And um, the patterns of linkage disequilibrium and the mapping of these um, of markers indicated that the loci were really distributed throughout the genome. And also that um, the 32 loci represent at least a minimum of 17 different genomic regions of this fly um, genome showing post-associated differentiation. A much different pattern than one got from looking at the outlier um, analysis. Do you know what the karyotypes are in these populations of the inversion? Frequency? I wish I could. The problem with um, um, frugivorous tephridids is they have lousy polyteen chromosomes, um, which has always been a hang up. So we've always had to go back to the old fashioned roll up your sleeve stir event way of just mapping and looking at recombination distances uh, amongst crosses to infer, uh, to infer inversion polymorphism. Now, hopefully, um, we're beginning to do a lot of high throughput sequencing, so we may, in fact, from specific crosses, eventually maybe we'll, we'll get lucky and find some of the breakpoints in some of these um, crosses and be able to begin to map um, inversions and uh, I think there's overlapping inversions, uh, polymorphisms in these populations, and eventually maybe we'll be able to do that. Uh, but right now, we still have to rely on good old-fashioned genetic crosses and, and variation and recombination rates between crosses to infer uh, inversions. So in, in the obvious interpretation, you're just seeing latitudinal declines and inversion frequencies? 
there's loads of loci in there that are associated with Exactly. And it turns out, this is an, uh, another aspect of the story, some of that inversion polymorphism um, probably was introduced by introgression down from Mex up from Mexico. So that's exactly what we think is going on, that past periods of geographic isolation um, contributed to inversion differences between the populations. Subsequently, there was some contact and integration in which adaptive climbs formed in the ancestral hawthorn infesting population. And the variation in life history um, in those climbs contributed to this fly being able to explore new host plants locally and sympatrically that had different fruiting times and required different life histories to adapt to. Exactly. That makes sense to everybody? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so, um, so let's look at the life history of this fly and let's look for factors that might be um, causing genome-wide um, adaptation or genome-wide selection. And, and here's a, a, a diagram here of the natural history and biology of Ragley's pomonella. Um, and we'll sort of work this in now to uh, once we understand the biology more, to see how we can um, look at certain aspects of the diapause life history that might be under strong divergent selection between apple and hawthorn flies. And then we'll try to link selection occurring or associated with those um, traits, those life history traits, with the pattern of genome-wide differentiation. Okay, so Ragolides is univoltine. It has one generation per year. It overwinters in a um, facultative pupil diapause. And in the summer, the flies uh, close and emerge as adults. They then rendezvous on their respective um, host plants to mate and oviposit. Here's their mating. Here's the female ovipositing the fruits. They lay eggs, usually singly, in a fruit. The eggs hatch, largely feed within the fruits. That's why they're major economic passes. And then when the fruit excises from the trees in the fall, the larvae then leave the fruit, they burrow into the soil an inch or two deep, and they pupate, completing the life cycle. So a key consideration is that apples and hawthorns fruit at different times of the year. They have different seasonalities. In fact, preferred apple varieties fruit about three to four weeks earlier than hawthorns in the field season. And therefore, white post fruits that the females oviposit into in men and flies use as rendezvous sites for courting and mating actually represent seasonally different resource islands. That the fly, since it's univoltine and has only one generation a year, has a longevity of about a month out in nature, they have to match their life histories to maximize the availability of suitable host fruits. And so you can imagine now that selection pressures are different on apple and hawthorn flies in order to achieve the <coughs> synchrony between their life cycle and host food availability, their temporal resource islands. And how do they do that? Well, there's two primarily um, areas of, of diversion <coughs> selection probably on the life history of these flies. One is, if you think about it, the flies have to hit a target when they're coming out and closing as adults. And that apple target is earlier in the season than the hawthorn target. Um, consequently, apple flies have to break diapause sooner and complete development earlier than hawthorn flies in, able to, in order to utilize the earlier seasonal fruiting apple hooks. And here's some results from sort of standardized or garden type experiments in which um, Apple and hawthorn pupae were reared under the same environmental condition. Uh, these are two sites in Urbana, Illinois, in Grant, Michigan. And the basic idea here is just to show you the mean of number of days to eclosion um, for apple versus hawthorn adults. And what you can see here is that apple flies do, in fact, eclose under standardized conditions about two weeks earlier than hawthorn flies fitting the chronology of when their host plants fruit out in nature. And you can also see that there's a bit of, of clinal variation in this characteristic and trait uh, as well. And flies from the north actually close a little bit earlier than flies from the south. Conditions are colder earlier 
in the season in the north, and so flies have to actually develop faster to hit their targets up north than in the south. So that's one aspect of the diapause lift history that's under differential selection. Um, but diapause isn't a single trait. And another trait, if, if we think about it, if we shift our attention from a, a timing of adult occlusion to what's going on earlier in the pupil life stages of these flies before winter rather than after winter, there's also another um, window in which divergent selection is affecting diapause life history. And what is this? Well, if you think about it, um, apples of size from trees earlier also before the onset of winter than hawthorns do. And so consequently, apple larvae leave apple fruits and pupae earlier in the season relative to the onset of winter than hawthorn <coughs> pupae do. Therefore, there's a longer period of time that apple fly pupae has to remain in the ground before the onset of cold winter temperatures than is the case for hawthorn pupae. And it turns out that ragolites are facultative diapausers. That is, if they're exposed to warm enough conditions for a long enough period of time, they'll forego a deep pupil diapause and they'll begin to immediately develop into adults, which is disastrous stuff in the field because they will close at a time in the fall when suitable host food isn't available. So there's stronger selection then, um, at least in the early, for the earlier phen phenology of apples, to select for deeper initial diapause for apple flies to avoid non-diapause development. And so here's some similar um, Carmen Garden standardized environmental rearing uh, experiments with apple and hawthorn pupae, um, in this case along from Urbana, Illinois, up again to our Grant Michigan site. And what we see here is the percentage of non-diapausing pupae in the population. And you can see that at all St. Patrick sites, there's a lower percentage of non-diapausing that you can use in apple flies, earlier fruiting, they have to withstand long, uh, hotter temperatures for a long period of time than the corresponding um, hawthorn population at the St. Patrick site. And again, you can see clines. So, so hawthorn flies have to develop relatively more rapidly and push the limits to get in before winter hits. Therefore, they're more uh, susceptible to non-diapausing development than apple flies are. OK, so what does this allow us to do then? Um, well, this allows us to test for genetic di um, associations with diapause life history in these flies. And we could look, for instance, for gene frequency correlations at some of the markers that we said before show differences between the populations. We could look for associations with the timing of diapause, adult um, uh, occlusion time in these flies, right? And we could also actually conduct selection experiments, for instance, by lengthening the pre-wintering period for hawthorn flies right here. <coughs> Normally, let's say they experience about seven days of, of room temperature before the onset of winter. That would be standard conditions that a hawthorn fly might experience, let's say, at our grant site. Right? But we could lengthen that. We could make it, let's say, 32 days. And by doing so, by increasing that pre-wintering period um, for hawthorn flies, we could essentially um, create conditions that that pupae would face if it was infesting the alternative apple fruit. And then we could look for a genetic response in these selected, uh, different selected conditions and try to match it to the patterns that we see geographically out in nature between the populations of apple and hawthorn flies that show differences across the genome. So do they differ? And the answer is, and here's just a summary slide, this is the results for the selection experiment, yes. Um, in fact, of the 17 genomic regions that I said before that show host differentiation in the population survey, turns out 16 of them showed significant response either in the selection experiment or related to adult occlusion time. Um, 26 of these, of these loci um, total um, responded in the pre-winter selection experiment. They represented at least 16 different regions. With respect to correlations with uh, 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 adult occlusion time, there are 20 loci that were significant, um, representing at least 10 different regions of the genome. And 10 were shared between the selection experiments and occlusion time studies. 
Uh, we could explain almost 50% R squared of the variation in implosion times just based on these um, microsatellite markers. So it would appear that um, by connecting the selection experiments, at least with the pattern of genomic differentiation in, in nature, we can rule out at least um, patterns that were generated by drift or isolation by distance and have some confirmation uh, that, in fact, uh, genome-wide selection on, on life history, diapause life history, could result in widespread patterns of genomic differentiation across the genome of these flies. So we can connect some of the dots and say that we can make some sense of seeing a continent's pattern rather than um, this alternative of genome island uh, view of differentiation in Ragalese. Now, this is a, 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 a recent study that Nora Pazansky's lab just completed of, of high throughput sequencing of uh, Anopheles gambia mosquitoes, the MNS forms. Remember, this is the initial study system that really um, captured the imagination of, of genetic architecture students uh, in terms of thinking of this genomic islands view. And there were three regions that, in an initial Turner study, that were shown to sh show high outlier status as evidence of genomic islands of speciation. However, in a more thorough high throughput sequencing, um, it turns out that, that this view is mistaken. And now looking at the MNS forms, it turns out that there's evidence for uh, widespread genomic differentiation between the MNS forms of Anopheles as well. So Ragalitis may not be alone. Um, the classic study system that sort of really captivated our imaginations about genomic islands of speciation turns out to more fit, more of a, at least an archipelago view of differentiation um, through the genome. Okay, so, so what about the theory behind um, islands of genomic um, divergence? Why were we um, thinking so strongly that that this view should mostly characterize um, early patterns of ecological differentiation with gene flow. Um, and part of the results or reason for this thinking came from some theory that Brian Charlesworth did and colleagues, although it was not corrected to the question of um, speciation with gene flow, um, but it was used to make an argument for why divergence hitchhiking uh, could really facilitate sympatric speciation or speciation with gene flow. Um, what Brian showed uh, was essentially uh, was trying to understand background selection in the context of a metapopulation with um, local uh, population adaptation. But this figure that he generated was used to make an argument for divergence hitchhiking. And what I have here, what we're showing here, is a figure where um, Brian and colleagues estimated what the FST value, the degree of diverse differentiation, should be between populations. Um, for a, a site under strong selection, there's a site under strong selection, and then we could figure out what the expectation should be at equilibrium for a neutral site at various recombination distances from that strongly selected other locus, right? And this is the pattern that Brian uh, and colleagues generated, and the key point here is that even at recombination distances that are quite far from the selected site, there should be a significant amount of FST, of genetic differentiation for neutral sites. Therefore, when we scan the genome, we should frequently pick up, even at, at rather far uh, mapping distances from a selected site, evidence for neutral differentiation. At least that was the argument. Um, and here we see what the value should look like for, a, uh, for the selected uh, site being under a, a lower selection coefficient of 0.1. It's still fairly pronounced. It may go only go out to be like five centimorgans, but we should still see it. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is, is a couple of things. One, Brian didn't intend, I think, for this uh, uh, simulation and analytical study to be um, used for uh, analysis of speciation. Um, two things. One is that his effective population sizes, this is really a local adaptation model, his effective population sizes that were used were quite small, a thousand individuals in each of these um, small isolates. 
And also the migration rate is very low between the local populations, 0.001. So what happens when we actually use more realistic parameters for migration rate and population sizes? What's the expectation at, at least at, at um, selection, um, migration, um, drift equilibrium for FST between our populations? And here's the original results of Brian. And here's what we've been estimated. In fact, if we just increase the population size up to 100,000, perhaps, and move the migration rate up just a little bit to 1% per generation. And what one can see is that uh, that island of neutral differentiation, at least at equilibrium, quickly goes to zero. Um, so under more realistic parameters, at least, um, we might not, ex for speciation, we might not expect to see large islands of, of neutral differentiation surrounding a, a strongly selected site. There it is. Um, and we've subsequently derived um, what the estimates should be for the establishment of a new mutation. And they're very th they produce very similar results. I don't have time to talk about it in, in the talk right now, but in the questions and answers, if you're interested in looking at at what those results are, I can show you. But the take-home message is pretty much the same. Um, that under more realistic parameters, at least for um, selection, migration rates, and population sizes, we don't expect to see tremendously large um, islands of neutral differentiation um, or high, tremendously higher um, uh, probabilities of fixation or establishment of new mutations around a selected site. Uh, we could increase the number of loci under selection in these, uh, these models and see what happens. And in this case, um, the results really say that there could be three phases of, of speciation resulting. Um, that when there's just a few number of loci, in this case up to four loci, um, under strong selection. Here we've got a migration rate of 0.1, effective population size of 100,000, and we're adding more loci under strong selection to the genome and seeing what happens. Um, what we see in, in, is that um, the same pattern holds up until maybe you get four strongly selected, five strongly selected loci. And then what you begin to see is a period of time after this initial divergence between our populations um, where you can get a little bit of, of of an effect of facilitation of, of divergence hitchhiking. Right? So we get an elevation around our selected site. And then after we get to about 10 or 11 loci, we see the, the results of what we could call genomic hitchhiking, that the level of effective gene flow is reduced enough that we begin to uh, uh, accumulate neutral differentiation across the genome. So you go through some of these phases, at least, with speciation with gene flow, where um, Okay. where initially um, you get a period where there's a number of, of different loci that have to be fixed. Uh, you don't see much genomic hitchhiking. Then you go through an intermediate region, a middle region, where you can see evidence for some uh, facilitation of genomic hitchhiking. Although um, the important point here is that it still has to be, the, the, the site still has to be fairly close to the, the other locus under divergent selection. It still needs to be a, a, a couple of centimorgans or so. It's not as widespread. It's not 10 centimorgans, not 5 centimorgans. It's still rather restricted. And then you go through a later phase, at least, where um, there's enough low under divergent selection that differences accumulate all through the genome. So each locus you have there is just something like unlinked? Like exactly. Yeah, okay. Each locus is unlinked, so we're adding unlinked loci. And then we're saying, in this case, um, Let's, let's get a, a, a new mutation or look at the accumulation of, of, of neutral differentiation for a site at a given recombination distance to one of those loci in, in the genome that's under strong selection. Yeah. And, and this is the general pattern you'd expect to see sort of phases that the population goes through. Um, there is an effect that's contributed by divergence hitchhiking, but it's not as strong as we might have expect it, and you still have to have relatively tight linkage of those sites to the other site under strong, one of the sites under strong selection. How big is the genome? Of Ragolides? No, of this thing. Of this thing, we can make it infinite, because we're just adding um, new sites that are um, 
new sites that are unlinked. But that it does raise an issue that genome structure, the number of chromosomes, the recombination rate, and how they're distributed could influence the um, probabilities or effects that genomic hitchhiking, uh, genetic, I should say, divergence hitchhiking could have. Every time you have a new selected locus, you have a new chromosome. Essentially, yeah. You could think of it that way. Yeah. Yes? Okay, so in the last part here, I just want to um, try to make the connection. And I'm off camera for a second. I shall return. Um, that could we find um, at least um, other evidence from the transcriptome of the fly that um, allows us to tie together the idea that widespread selection on, on diapause related life history traits could generate widespread uh, divergence between these flies and their genome. Could we make that connection at least even more tangibly? And so what I want to show you now is moving more towards the physiological and genetic um, basis for diapause traits through this type of expression analysis through the life history of these flies. And so what we've been doing is working on the genetics of diapause um, phenotype by characterizing the transcriptome Aragonese pominella um, through larval pupil stages and different pupil stages and adult stages. This is work done with Hugh Robertson, Stuart Verlocker, Dan Hunt, Greg Raglan, and Deep Marshall. Schwartz, and we've been also looking at sort of the, the genomics of dormancy phenotypes by characterizing sort of physiological landmarks through diapause time course, and we can do this um, <laughs> taking a respirometer uh, respir approach, measuring metabolic rates through different life stages of the fly, essentially going as they go into diapause and they go out of diapause to look at differential expression patterns of marker loci. And I'm just to show you we're interested in the iPods initiation again as one key area of divergent selection on these flies, as well as diapause termination or breakage. Those are two critical areas or windows that we know or have good evidence that divergent selection is acting between apple and poplar flies. And this is just to show you uh, as we go into diapause, we can now take individual pupae and measure their respirometer rates or CO2 production to characterize the diapause characteristics, at least, the tendency of that in individual pupae. And what we see here is that there really is a difference between those individuals that go into diapause and are, are uh, true deep diapausers, as opposed to those that are non-diapausing. Diapausing flies really dive into a really uh, reduced level of metabolism, whereas um, non-diapausing flies, turns out, they, they um, decrease metabolic activity but they don't dive into a really low metabolic rate, and they eventually uh, terminate diapause and initiate adult de development. And we could look for um, transcriptional regulation differences, at least uh, through microarrays, between these different classes or categories of flies. And we could see um, that a whole bunch of genes are up and down regulated um, during this sort of critical decision-making period. Uh, in fact, it looks like diapausing pupae acts like they're really um, hypoxic, as if they're going into oxygen deprivation. And a lot of the pathways are related to this. Um, we can also look at, at diapause termination and do the same type of characterization of, of, of metabolic rates as an individual pupae comes out of diapause and then begins adult development. We see this plateauing where there's an initial slight rise, uh, relatively um, <coughs> plateaued, um, non-change in, in metabolic rate, and then an uptick again as the flight completes adult development. And we can look and have looked at expression patterns through all these different um, stages of, of diapause termination and subsequent adult development. And we've looked, uh, concentrated a lot in this initial period right here. And eventually what we found is that uh, we've now got 18 candidate loci that are really um, strongly up or down regulated right at what we think is the window or key window when diapause termination is, is taking place. 
Um, some involved in wet signaling, tyrosine metabolism, some biosynthesis of steroids. Uh, there are a set of, of, of particular traits that we might predict could be involved in diphosphate termination. We have also see that about at 24 to 48 hours, there's also a, a concerted changes in expression patterns of a lot of different genes. So there may be another critical period for timing or uh, besides just breakage itself or some of the key uh, genes that are up and down regulated during diapause breakage. So in this respect, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say more uh, one potential is that um, even though there may be key or critical uh, players or individual loci that are, are involved in the specific um, signal or target for terminating diapause with a cascade of, of subsequent genes um, being regulated off of that key sort of keystone locus, it's also possible um, that there's a lot of interplay between the pathways and determination of when that initial signal um, occurs. And downstream, there may be um, real um, important uh, reasons for uh, concerted patterns and, and uh, related patterns of differentiation of genes in the downstream pathway, such that a number of loci, when, when one's selecting for a different life history uh, uh, profile, could be under selection. It's not just as simple as thinking, oh, diboss termination is different between these two flies. So it just must be one master control timing gene. And that's all that has to change to shift the life history. What I'm arguing is it might actually be more complex than that. And it, it could involve a coordination of a number of different genes, not just that one trigger. And so I want, what I want to leave you with is, is a, a study that was done by Molly Burke. Uh, Tony Long's lab that just got recently got published in Nature, in which the selection was performed on Drosophila melanogaster, so we'll return to a model system. And selection was performed for shorter developmental timing mm -hmm. in the fly. Somewhat similar to what we might expect, for instance, in the apple race, with a rap more rapid rate of initial adult development and earlier diapause termination time. Right? And what these investigators found is back. Um, in a number of replicated lines, two replicated lines that were selected um, long term for faster um, larval development to adulthood, they found looking at genome scans and defined associated um, regions that differentiated between the control lines and these selected lines, they found evidence for widespread response across the genome of Drosophila melanogaster. It wasn't just a few loci, there were a number of loci that showed a response. And many of these loci fit with what one might expect when one's selecting for faster rates of development. Um, there are many signaling pathways. Some were involved in wing disc development, others in metamorphosis and organ development, imaginal disc, morphogenesis, et cetera. So the response here, at least for what I'm saying, is for a, a different life history profile was quite dramatic across the genome, which fits with at least an argument that maybe selection in, for life history differentiation in Phytophagus insects and adapting to, to host plants with differing phenologies, different pruning times, could actually respond, could result in widespread divergent selection across the genome of flies. So sort of to now link together um, what we see in terms of the genomic surveys of these flies right, with patterns that we see from selection experiments with patterns that we see in the transcriptome analysis. Um, so we're making a case that maybe in the early stages of, of, of divergence, and at least in Ragleys and other phytophagous insects that are <coughs> host shifting, um, when it involves when that involves a life history shift, um, the, the selection could be um, widespread across the genome, and the genetic response could be more widespread than what we thought previously. It may not be just islands of speciation. Um, it may really be that we might see a continents of divergence um, instead. There still be a topology to those continents, depending on selection strain, recombination rates, et cetera. But the whole of the genome might be more elevated above that neutral sea level. <laughs>
And so including then, um, this high throughput sequencing might really shift our focus um, to thinking about questions about the genomic architecture of divergence, away from just um, what has been a fruitful sort of beanbag approach looking at uh, individual speciation genes, we can now begin to think and ask questions and, and, and actually focus attention on genome-wide uh, patterns of differentiation. And it might modify our view of, of the genetics of speciation, I'm beginning to allow us to, to place individual speciation genes, at least, to be studied as part of a, of a collective and evolving genome. So thank you. Maybe if you have questions, um, you could join us for lunch. So right now we're gonna we're gonna head over to the silo um, for lunch. There, I think we ran a little bit over, so I think that would be best if you have questions to, to join us there or come up. Thanks, everyone, and, and thank you very much.